Good morning again, everyone. Welcome to Mount Carmel Bible Church. I'm Pastor Richard. Uh, today, uh, we're running a little bit behind, so I'm going to try to speed through the beginning part. Today, we're going to be talking about Jesus' first sermon. Um, his first sermon, uh, a lot of people, uh, there's been discussion about this, and I'm not, under, I'm not sure exactly why. Some people say his first sermon was the Sermon on the Mount, and that's not true. Um, actually, his first sermons, we probably don't even have recorded. In fact, we don't have recorded, but it is mentioned in Luke. Oops. Um, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. This is after he... Of course, he, he taught in the synagogues when he was young. Um, there's a lot of uh, his history that we don't have recorded because he was under 30, so uh, he wasn't considered in the Jewish culture spiritually mature. So his ministry started when he turned 30, and he was baptized by John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, he told his disciples, uh, John's disciples, of who Jesus was, and they spread the word throughout the land. Of course, when Jesus was baptized, he went out and was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. And after he returned is when uh, Luke 4, 14 begins. So let's go through that. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. He started teaching there. We don't have them recorded, but he started teaching when he got back from the wilderness. He continues in John, or I'm sorry, Luke 4, 16, as, it, as we continue to read. And he came to Nazareth, uh, where he had been brought up. And as it was custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll from the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering the sight to the blind, to set liberty, uh, set liberty those who are oppressed and to claim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled the scroll up, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And all the eyes in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the uh, gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? Then he was rejected in Nazareth. And he said to them, doubtless you will quote me uh, to me the pro this proverb, physician, heal thyself. What we have heard you do in Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up, three years, six months, and a great famine came over the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of a city to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elijah, and none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman in Syria. When they heard these things, all the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of town and brought him to the bow of the hill on which the town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. This is scripture reading from Luke 14 through Luke 
our group four, 14 through 30. But what do we get from all this? There's a lot of information here. First, we don't know how his, how his uh, ministry started uh, other than bits and pieces. We know he went to Galilee. We know he went to, uh, across the land to Capernaum, was mentioned. He was preaching and performing miracles. None of those were recorded, but this was recorded in his hometown. People knew him. He grew up there. They knew him as a small boy. They knew him as Joseph's son. They knew him. And when he came into town, Jesus stirred up the crowd. The words he spoke offended people. The people in the synagogue got filled with wrath, anger. Why? Jesus came and spoke truth. He came to deliver this message. And it should have been a glorious message. Here, this prophecy is fulfilled, and you are here to hear it. As I'm reading this to you, this prophecy is fulfilled about this Messiah. How amazing is that to be? If you're in the crowd, you are part of God's history. You are part of what he planned out, and you're there to witness it. That sounds like it should be glorious news. But why wasn't it? Why wasn't it glorious news? Jesus' preaching wasn't heard by the people of Nazareth. They came for the show. They heard about what he did in Galilee and Capernaum. They heard about the miracles, the healings. They came to see that. They came to see, be witness to the miracles and this spectacle. They want to know what all the fuss is about. They're not coming to hear the word of the Lord. They're not coming to listen to the prophecy. They're not coming to understand the Bible. They're coming to be entertained. <coughs> they want that rock show. They want the, the spectacle. They're not coming for God. They're coming for entertainment. And when Jesus said, you know what? You're not getting that. The Bible says that this uh, widow was given food in a time where everyone was starving. But not everyone was given food. The leper was healed, but not all of the lepers. Just that one. We tend to think that ourselves, right? We want healing for ourselves. We want, we want all of our wishes to come true because God is our genie. But that's not the case. The word of the God, the word of God is not just about good things. It's about warnings. It's about cautions. It's about revealing to ourselves our shortcomings. When you go to church, we want to feel like God loves us. We want to know that he's there for us, and he is. But we also need to know that we're sinners. We don't deserve anything. We don't deserve our health. We don't deserve our wealth. We don't deserve a, a place to live. We don't deserve our friends, our family. We don't deserve anything. Because we're sinners. The more you read the Bible, you should realize how bad we are. How bad I am. If you look at the Ten Commandments, I bet each and every one of you have committed multiple offenses on multiple commandments. If you're sitting there saying, no, not me, you're lying. And you're lying to yourself. And that's bearing false witness, so there's one right there. Okay? Jesus' preaching stirred the crowd up, got them angry. And we need to remember God's word is a word of judgment and grace. Yeah.
yes, we, we should feel blessed that we're forgiven. But we also need to know that we needed to be forgiven. There's a reason why Jesus came here. Because we fell short. Because we sinned. Because we're horrible people. Even the best of us are horrible people. Patsy. Even the best of us are falling short. Even the best of us are not worthy to be even thought of by God. But because of his grace, because of his love and his guidance, we are. God's word is of judgment and grace. And it should cause you to consider and reconsider constantly. Look at our lives and look, what are we doing? And how can we be better? Every time we sin, we should be able to recognize that because we should be reading the Bible to recognize it. And every time we recognize that we sin, we should feel sorry. Because guess what? Every sin we commit is another scar on Jesus. Every sin we commit is another beating he had to endure. That beating, those scars, we deserve. And he took for us. Every time I watch Passion of the Christ, I feel that. Because he wasn't getting beaten for those just those people in Israel. He wasn't getting beaten for somebody in another country in another time. He was getting beaten because of me. Because of what I do. Because of what I have done. And God's word should be resonating in you. You are not worthy. You're not. But Jesus came here to take that punishment. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure where I remember reading this from, but this resonates with me all the time. The word of God, it comforts the afflicted, and it afflicts the comfortable. We all know we're sinners. And the word of God is there to let us know you are forgiven. Not because you deserve it. Not because you mean that much to anybody but because you mean that much to God if you're comfortable with your life if you're comfortable with who you are if you're comfortable with being the way you are if you think I've done what I need to do I'm getting into heaven you're good getting into heaven has nothing to do with who you are. It's because of God. It's because of Jesus. And he did this for you. And you sit back and think you're okay now? I'm going to use Bonnie here. You're a teacher for the people that don't know. You have students in your art class that come out and just throw together paintings, right? That put no effort into it whatsoever. And you probably have some really talented people through your years of service that just can throw something together and it's beautiful and it's wonderful and it's immaculate and it's something you could put up in a gallery and sell for hundreds of dollars. And then you have those students that try, that want to do better, that listen to your every word, patiently continuing their efforts to make their painting skills better, and are not doing well. We all know those, there's people out there like that. Well, guess what? 
we're all like that. We all should be like that. Because no matter what we do in life, we're never going to be perfect. Never. We're never going to be able to throw our lives together and have everything come out perfectly. Not to God. But I know you know what I'm talking about. Those students that work hard, that you see struggling, trying to get better, those you are going to remember for the rest of your life. The ones with talent, yeah. You see talented kids go through there all the time, I'm sure. And I bet you don't remember them all. But the ones that really try, you remember them. So let's take that and apply it to God. Think about it. God is calling himself our father. He's our creator. We are his subjects. We are here to praise him and worship him. And if we're here just given the talents that he's given us and just using those talents, just throwing it together here, I'm sure he'll enjoy that. But if we struggle and try to get better, work hard to get better, even if we fail, he's going to remember us. He's going to know that we're trying and we're worshiping him and truly mean it. Don't you think he's going to have more special notes for us when we get to heaven? Who's he going to look after? The ones who do the work? Or the ones who punch the clock? The ones who show up on Sunday, the ones who put the money in the pot, the ones who just show up, or the ones who work. Say, you know what, Lord, I'm sorry. I, I, I just read this. All my life I've been sinning because I didn't realize this. Now I'm going to do better. I'm going to know that, that I've been sinning, and I'm going to try to improve myself. I'm going to try hard to avoid these things that displease you, and I'm going to try harder to please you. Not because I have to, but because I want to. That's where we should be in our life. That's where we should be in our spiritual life. Because that's what matters. And one more thing. Have you ever known someone and watched them grow up? Someone who you may have changed their diapers, babysat them, and then watch them grow up and hear them to be a, a good person, an educated person, someone who knows things, and try to take them seriously as an adult? It's difficult. It's difficult. So these people in Nazareth, they saw Jesus as a toddler. They saw him as that weird kid who kept doing, going off and speaking to God and going to the synagogues and reading and knowing things that they didn't know. And here he has grown up, coming back, and people are saying he's doing miracles. People are saying that he's the Messiah. And he comes back and says that he is. So they had a hard time understanding that and a hard time believing that. Maybe that's something we could work on too. When my father passed away, we had the funeral. Um, I was introduced to the, the new fire chief of that town. I grew up in the town, it was always my dad. There was a couple guys before him that I didn't remember, but my dad was the fire chief. And uh, this funeral, the new fire chief came up to me, gave me a hug, Thanked him. I didn't recognize him at first. He was one of those kids that I used to babysit. He was a little guy. Now he's grown up, professional, well trained, knowledgeable, and a good person. It's hard to imagine little children being adults and leaving. Maybe we should take a little more time as adults looking at the children, giving them opportunities to lead us. As we mentioned before, my son uh, created this monstrosity and calls it a wheelbarrow. 
that functions well. I couldn't have done that. I couldn't have done what he did. When he comes, when it comes to building things like that, I'm deferring more to him. He's also built a rabbit cage that is much better than I would have done. It's hard to look at your children as skillful people, as intelligent people. I'm looking at my daughter, hoping someday I'll think of that. Never mind. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll pay for that later. Um, it's, it's hard to look at your children as productive members of society because they'll always be your children. But sometimes they'll surprise you. We need to try, start trying to be more open with that, giving them the opportunity to surprise you, being open to them correcting us when we make mistakes. Because... We don't want to admit it, and we cannot admit it to them. But often they do. So I hope you leave here today thinking about this. If you're reading the Bible and you get stuck on something and you don't like it, or if you go to church and you hear the pastor say something you don't like, you think, that, I don't like that. That's not a bad thing. If you're offended by the word of God, be offended. But think about it. If you're offended, maybe that's because you're too comfortable in the sinful life. Maybe it's time to make some changes. Change your heart. Change the direction you're going with your spiritual journey. How many times have I said, if you're studying the Bible 20 minutes a night or 20 minutes a week, Double it. Work a little harder. Put some more time into it. Put some more effort into it. Every single one of us can do that. Every single one of us falls short. And just remember, if it wasn't for Jesus, not one person would be getting into heaven. Not one. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity you have given us and the, the ability you've given us to come together, to listen to your words, to hear your words and feel your understanding behind them. Thank you for these lessons you've given us in the Bible. Help us to absorb them. Help them to come into our hearts and, and make us better people. We know how you want us to be because you told us. Help us to listen to your word and not to the world around us. Help us to listen to the spiritual guidance you've given us and not to the worldly distractions that are here. Help these words to go into our hearts and change us and improve us. Not because we have to, but because we want to. We want to be closer to you, Lord. We do. And we thank you for everything you've given us to get us closer to you. Help us embrace it. Help us get closer. We love you, Lord. And we thank you for everything you've given us. And in Jesus' name.